Hello, my name is Teresa Shishka and today I'm going to be talking about FDD pet brain in non-Alzheimer's dementia. There are three predominant neurodegenerative default disorders. You will have learned all about Alzheimer's disease, but today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Lewy body dementia and frontotemporal dementia. There's also another biggie, the uh, vascular dementias, and then there are other rarer dementias. But today I'm just going to talk about Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, and vascular dementia. We've already learned about displaying um, FDG pet brain on grayscale. It can also be displayed in a color scale. This is the color scale that we see on the right hand side. Each increment is a, it's a 20 point scale, so each increment is a 5% change. And sometimes subtle differences are easier to see on the color scale than is seen on the grayscale image. Both are correct. Um, we see uptake within the gray matter in the basal ganglia and the thalamus, so called it head, putamen and thalamus, as well as background cortical uptake. Important anatomical regions we've already learnt are the posterior cingulate gyri, uh, the precuneus, but also here we have the uh, primary sensory motor strip, which up uptake at this site decreases in normal ageing, but tends to be preserved in um, under dementias. Another important area is the parieto um, temporal association uh, area, which features heavily in Alzheimer's disease. The EANM have produced guidelines for structured reporting, and this is some of their suggestions. I think it's very important to focus on specific areas, and so comment about the posterior cingulate gyri precuneus, the parieto association cortex, um, the part of, sorry, parieto temporal association cortex, mesotemporal lobes, and then go through systematically through each of the lobes, frontal, occipital, temporal, parietal lobes, anterior cingulate gyri, basal ganglia, thalamus, and the cerebellum. Also, it's worth mentioning any relevant CT findings such as volume loss or an infarct. But as the CT we use for brain imaging is purely or predominantly for attenuation correction, we should use this with caution for structural interpretation. It's useful to come up with an interpretation or conclusion or a differential. Other things to mention should be for comparative data and if there's any evidence of movement artifact or if an EEG has been used, for example, for epilepsy. So firstly, looking at Lewy body dementia. So Lewy body dementia presents with an acetylcholine deficiency, which is similar to what happens in Alzheimer's disease. However, you also have the deposition of Lewy bodies, which are these unusual aggregates of protein, and they can be found mainly in the brainstem and the limbic system, and these are characteristic. It's a progressive disease, it's a progressive dementia, fluctuating cognitive function, it usually presents with a classical triad of visual hallucinations, spontaneous Parkinsonism, as well as the fluctuating cognition. It's progressive and fluctuating in its course. And the FTG pattern is actually very similar to Alzheimer's disease. However, it also involves the occipital lobe, which we see here posteriorly. So frontal, temporal, um, parietal, and occipital lobe we see posteriorly. Interestingly, there's also relative sparing of the posterior cingulate gyri in this case. However, you also have loss of dopaminergic neurons. And so if Lewy body dementia is suspected, a DAT scan is very useful. Here we have an example of uh, occipital hypermetabolism. If we use look systematically, we can see um, that there is quite a large area, it's relatively asymmetrical in this case, of prior to decrease uptake which extends well into the occipital lobe. It also affects the uh, temporal lobe, it's quite extensive. Just want to highlight something called the posterior, uh, the cingulate island sign, where you've got quite focal uptake in the cingulate, but the, the hypermetabolism is, is less marked. So this occurs with the lewy body dementias. Here we have another example. And this paper actually from Brown and Town Radio Graphics is one of the best papers for looking at FDG pet patterns. And I think we've got a copy of it uploaded. Um, 
But just to mention the sensory motor strip, this is preserved. So the areas of decreased uptake obviously are fainter. Um, anything that's purple, you've got, um, uh, is less than three standard deviations difference. Anything that's blue is two standard deviations difference. So there's significant decreased hypermetabolism or significant hypermetabolism is in purple. Um, so here we can see that posteriorly there's decreased uptake, which does extend into the posterior cingulate. Um, and it also extends into the uh, occipital lobe and it also extends into the temporal lobes. So this is, uh, Prior to temporal hypermetabolism with occipital hypermetabolism, this is suggestive of the really body dementia. Here we can compare head to head almost um, an Alzheimer's pattern with uh, a, a Lewy body dementia pattern. Here we've got very extensive um, posterior parietal decreased uptake, extensive occipital hyper, uh, temporal hypermetabolism, sorry, uh, and uh, also a hypermetabolism uh, in the uh, posterior cingulate gyri. In this one, this uptake in the posterior cingulate gyri is relatively better preserved, and you get quite focal uh, uptake, hypometabolism, sorry, in the occipital lobe, which extends into the parietal lobes. So temporoparietal hypometabolism in Alzheimer's disease, and here we also have occipital hypometabolism with relative sparing of the posterior cingulate gyri. Here we have a nice example of this um, singular island sign where you've got relatively decreased uptake, parietal and decreased occipital uptake, relative sparing of the posterior singular uptake, decreased uptake in the uh, temporal lobes. This is Lewy body dementia. Moving on, vascular dementias um, can be due to small and large vessel disease. Uh, in terms of small vessel disease, PET's not really particularly useful for looking at this. This is usually picked up on MRI. And the prevalence is declining due to improved treatment for hypertension and hyperlipidemia. What we do see on PET is if someone's had strokes or multiple strokes or larger kind of areas of hypermetabolism where there's also a low density on the CT component of the study. And this can be uh, related to any of the cerebral artery territories. But what's important is if you have, uh, if, if you've got an infarct affecting the frontal lobe or internal capsules involved, you end up with something called crossed cerebrocellular diastasis, which means that your contralateral cerebellum has got hypermetabolism. So you've got an infarct here in the, in the right frontal area, you've got contralateral um, cerebellar hypermetabolism. Here we've got a big stroke that we can see large photopenic deficit in the right parietal region with a corresponding low density on CT. And here we've got another uh, infarct, but this time in the left frontal area. So we know that the pink uh, uptake suggests there's very good uptake. The sort of blues and the greens are areas of hypermetabolism. So this is quite marked left frontal hypermetabolism. So you can have multiple infarcts, you can have a single infarct. Uh, so this is vascular dementia. Moving on to frontal temporal dementia. Well, this again is due to intracellular deposition of abnormal proteins. Um, this is mainly a sporadic disease. There's a genetic component within it. The diagnosis is, is actually very, very challenging. And there are some distinct forms. There are, there's a, a frontal, uh, a, there's a frontal uh, dementia or a kind of more temporal based dementia, depending on the uh, pattern of uptake. So the frontal predominant is the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia. And patients usually present with disinhibitive and impulsive behavior. Um, and then you have PPA, um, which kind of usually affects more the language, uh, word finding, um, which is a more temporal based. In frontotemporal dementia, you get hypermetabolism, obviously, in the anterior frontal lobes, the anterior temporal lobes, but also in the anterior cingulate. So this is this blue area. Also within the insula, which is where the arrow is pointing here, which is kind of insula or island, which is this kind of hidden bit of the cortex, and the uncus, which is like the most medial part of the um, um, medial temporal lobe. 
So Pick's disease is an example of a frontotemporal dementia, predominantly frontal. And this is, gives you a personality change rather than memory loss. This is a very old slide, uh, but it shows that there's hypermetabolism here anteriorly in the frontal lobe. And Pick's disease was first described by, uh, in, in 1926 by Dr. Pick. And uh, you've got atrophy with the presence of cytoplasmic inclusion bodies. Um, so this was Pick's disease. In terms of the uh, more temporal uh, lobe subtypes, it, it, sometimes it, they're classified as, as two, sometimes as three. But as I said, this is sort of looking at, at naming and word finding issues. And if we look at this uh, PET scan, we can see that um, so the bottom row shows really where highlights where there's decreased metabolism. So there's decreased metabolism in the anterior cingulate here, but also marked decreased metabolism within the temporal lobes and the mesial temporal lobes. Here we've got an example. It's quite nicely seen on the grayscale imaging, but we've got marked anterior uh, hypermetabolism with anterior temporal hypermetabolism. Personally, I find this slightly easier. This is the same study in color. And you can see that because the, the color scale is, is, is pink and then it goes to green, you can see that this frontal hypermetabolism, well, I can personally see it better on this one. But as I said, this is a personal preference and this is anterior temporal hypermetabolism. So this is frontotemporal dementia. Another example here, uh, so from this paper, we know that anything that's sort of purple, well, those areas are where there is hypermetabolism, anterior cingulate frontal lobe here, also affecting the anterior temporal lobe, frontotemporal dementia. Just want to mention some of the rare dementias. Um, actually, quite a lot of these that we've already covered, you wouldn't necessarily be picking this up is usually a, a specific question from the neurologist and then you look for these areas. Yeah, but specifically for the, the rare ones, this is definitely a neurological question. And uh, yeah, this, this, these are uncommonly uh, requested, but they do, they do come around and it's just worth mentioning. Um, so first of all, you've got um, posterior cerebral atrophy, which is the same thing as, as atypical Alzheimer's disease. And you've got really extensive posterior hypermetabolism. So actually um, the whole uh, posterior, so the posterior cingulate, the occipital lobe, the parietal lobes, as well as sort of going down into the temporal lobes is, is reduced. But the temporal lobe is less bad than the occipital and parietal lobes and posterior cingulate gyri. Um, so this is less of a memory loss. It's more um, visual decline um, and, and, and sort of complex recognition of faces. And here's an example of an atypical or a non-amnesic Alzheimer's. It's really extensive hypermetabolism posteriorly affecting the posterior cingular, the, po the, the parietal and occipital lobes. Um, not as bad in the, uh, in the temporal lobes. That's why it's non-amnesic. There's a cortical basal degeneration, and this usually affects uh, its hypermetabolism affecting the basal ganglia and thalamus, and sometimes the uh, ipsilateral sensory motor cortex. So here we see that there's hypermetabolism affecting the thalamus, and then the, in the adjacent uh, cortex, a little bit of frontal hypermetabolism. This is very rare. Huntington's career. Uh, again, the historical slide, here we've got decreased uptake within the cortate head. So first of all, the cordate uptake declines and then the tamalone uptake. And it's again, it's a genetic uh, condition, slow progressive, slow progression. Um, in terms of HIV, HIV encephalopathy and what's called HIV um, associated neurocognitive disorder, you have sort of a global uh, decrease in uptake with preserved uptake in the deep structures. So in the basal ganglia and thalamus, um, we don't tend to see this very much because of really good HIV treatments. But in the early days of HIV, um, this was a condition that sort of came presented as if it was dementia. Other rare conditions include um, SPS, where there's 
issues with sort of coordinating eye movements. Um, and this again can be quite difficult to diagnose. I've actually only seen this ever come across twice, I think, as a request from a neurologist. This is very rare, but it's a specific question. And you get sort of hypermetabolism in the uh, frontal cortex, um, in the insular cortex, uh, and also in the brainstem. So other dimensions that we don't tend to image on PET, things like <laughs> Kreutzfeldt, Jakob, and Castell, but are included in the sort of dimension list. So statistical parametric mappings, and all the examples that we've shown you so far have been on visual assessment. And this is kind of what I'm used to doing, because that's how I've learned. But I know that, of course, there are packages such as BRAS and Cortex-ID. So uh, this is some statistical uh, analysis. Uh, and what happens is that your, your pet brain um, gets realigned into a, um, into a standard atlas, and then you have normalization of the data to a reference region using thalamus, and then that data set is compared to a normal reference database and you come up with a z-score. And you see all subtle uh, foci um, of hypermetabolism that you may not see visually. And this has been recommended possibly for, for people who are first starting off looking at, at, at brain pets. Um, it, it is an adjunct. Uh, it's not a necessity, but it, it's there. I wanted to mention a couple of potential pitfalls. Uh, so if you've got a low density structure, uh, particularly in the temporal lobes, is this could be a, an arachnoid cyst. It's not a stroke, um, but this is where arachnoid cysts occur. And uh, cerebral atrophy, and this causes problems with the SPM software. If you've got brain atrophy, it sort of misinterprets it as, as, as hypermetabolism. So it's something just to be very wary of. So this is really a summary of the atypical Alzheimer's pattern. I'll just say the big three, a Lewy body dementia, looks a bit like Alzheimer's, but also extends to the occipital lobe. Relative sparing of the posterior cingulate. Frontotemporal is very much the anterior frontal lobes and the anterior temporal lobes, remember Pick's disease. And there are lots of different temporal, uh, form, uh, temporal dimensions there. And then vascular can be multiple cortical infarcts, could be single cortical infarct. We don't tend to image for those. And then there are all the kind of rarer things which I've shown you, which hopefully you know, don't tend to see very often, but um, just so that you're aware that they're there. I wanted to share with you also um, a possible structured report. This is how I report and describe the procedure. Um, you can mention the administrative activity if there's any misregistration, which is quite important. Um, movement artifacts. Sometimes it's better to acquire a pet for longer so that you, you can just select the images where you don't have an uh, artifact. You compare any comparisons to previous imaging or MRI, specifically mentioned the posterior cingulate gyro precuneus, uh, the mesial temporal lobes, um, and then specifically look at temporal lobes, frontal, parietal, and occipital lobes, look at the basal ganglia and thalamus and the cerebellum, and then come to an interpretation. Uh, or issue a, a kind of more generalized uh, interpretation, so it's compatible with a neurodegenerative disorder, most suggestive of X, Y, and Z, or Lewy body, or Alzheimer's. This would be my recommendation. These are some of the useful references. Thank you very much for listening.